Um, Ian, welcome to Warrior Within. Mm, thanks for having me, Asher. I guess it'd be a nice place. Well, firstly, let me start by asking you, um, in this kind of uncertain time that we're in right now, how's everything going for you? You're well and safe mm -hmm. and the family's well and safe? Yeah, I live uh, just on an island off the coast of Vancouver, Canada. So um, sort of a place that they don't have any traffic lights at all. That's how small it is. So uh, I moved here about five years ago, actually, to get out of the city. Uh, I grew up in Vancouver and then uh, actually it was after my divorce that um, a smaller community was calling me. And uh, so I came out here and I uh, met my current partner, actually not on the island, but close by and uh, came back here and our son was born just uh, about 18 months ago. So I, this place is definitely feels like home for me. And I'm um, yeah, really grateful to be actually right up close to nature. And so it's nice to be able to yeah, to feel that connection, especially now as it's going to spring. And in some ways it's easy to forget, you know, until you turn on the news, of course, or head to the grocery store that, you know, we're kind of in the middle of something unprecedented, as many have said many times. No, absolutely. And I'm sure we'll probably circle back around to it mm -hmm. during the course of the conversation. But mm -hmm. um, I guess getting back to the beginning point, for those um, listening to this who, who don't know don't know you or don't know your work, can, can you tell us a little bit about... Um, I guess what it is you do now and, and maybe mm -hmm. a little about how you got to that place. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose I've been a filmmaker now about 13 years or so. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I grew up in, as I said, in Vancouver, I, I was inter in, interested in film, but never really took to it actually until after university, uh, a friend, uh, he graduated college and he didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. And so like every sort of wacky internet idea, he decided, well, what if he just put out, you know, to the, to the internet um, that he would come work anywhere for a week just to give it a taste. And he would share about his travels and he'd actually donate the money uh, that he earned to charity. And so uh, I helped him launch the project because he's my best friend from, uh, from elementary school. And, um, and it took, you know, he ended up getting jobs from all over Canada at first and then the U.S. And uh, I came on board about halfway through that kind of wild adventure and just began filming because we thought, you know, hey, this has to be a film, I think. And um, so, yeah, we finished it. Uh, that was back in 2007. And then I spent a couple of years actually turning it into a film. And then that uh, we, we uh, released it, toured it. Uh, CBC picked it up, which is like the, you know, the Canadian uh, BBC. And then I just kept being a filmmaker after that um, because uh, I could say, I, you know, I found my calling. I would say my work shifted, though, from uh, just, I mean, it certainly was documentary was my interest. But what I think I realized at the same time was, I was sort of awakening into my, I don't know what to call it, global conscience or, or sort of activist uh, uh, per identity. And what I was actually uh, right around the time, you know, of course, uh, uh, Iraq had been invaded. It was after 9-11 in the U.S. And there was definitely that sort of sense in the air that things needed to change, you know, that there was kind of a suicidal path that humanity was headed on. And so I realized that film um, seemed to me the most uh, effective way of actually shifting consciousness in a in a short time or in, a, in an effective way and so i and the power of story and so i really began to look at film in that fashion and then this, since then i began to look also at emergent culture that was happening all over the world uh from you know Bur the desert to burning man which I ended up going six times and made a few films about to uh fukushima after 311 you know, with a partial nuclear meltdown i made a film about the buddhist response to that time uh, and then more recently i've been a, uh, at a community in portugal for the last five years uh, uh, attending what they offer, which is called the Love School, which looks at actually a whole different approach to love and sexuality and partnership within the context of village and, uh, and what it takes to really build a community of trust. So that's sort of my, the, the thread through all of that has been really this, yeah, this question about um, what are these seeds of culture that we want to cultivate and how do I accelerate that? It sounds fascinating. And then obviously there's been a bit of a shift or, or, or a move towards, I guess, men's work and, and the mythological mm -hmm. nature of that as well. Was there, was there a point where that, um, where that was kind of apparent that you needed yeah. to go in that direction? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, one of my previous films as well, uh, which came out in uh, 2018, uh, was called Amplify Her. And that really looked at women in electronic music. Uh, it actually came from uh, experience of Burning Man, like maybe a lot of good ideas, where I, I felt this sort of 
sense below the surface of the culture was this idea of the rise of the feminine, right? And uh, I, I thought, well, like, it felt very esoteric and not really tangible, like to, to just sort of speak about it in those abstract terms. And so I thought, well, what if I, I could make it visible in a way by following actual women artists and like how they were using their creativity and uh, the experience of, the, of their own lives to, to demonstrate actually that there was this emergence happening. And so that became a documentary project as well as a graphic novel series and an animated series too, all under that banner called Amplify Her. And uh, a few years into that project, which had me studying archetypes and mythology, particularly reading authors like you know, Clarissa, Picolas, Estes, and uh, Marion Woodman, and uh, like other Jungian scholars, uh, I had another kind of um, sort of inner confrontation when I realized I was studying the feminine, you know, over the last few years, and I realized I had knew so little about the masculine. And, uh, and, and that blind spot to me actually, you know, became more clear about why, you know, because I think the things that are closest to us, to us are our own shadows, of course, you know, we can't see them because they're our blind spots. And so that had me shift actually into the sense of curiosity, like, wait, what, what, um, what is it about the masculine that I, I don't even know that I don't know? Uh, and that had me, again, sort of become more curious. And then it was actually an experience with um, my grandfather, actually, who uh, for many years he was estranged from our family, and I didn't really know him growing up. And um, about uh, 2005, I finally went to go f visit him. He was actually this sort of mysterious character, you know, that lived in the forest, um, and, uh, and I went to visit him finally, and, and we made connection in a meaningful way. And it was actually a, a beautiful bond that we shared. Um, and, uh, and then we kept in touch after that. And then we kind of drifted away again, again, because, you know, he has his own interests and I had mine. Uh, and then he died actually in 2015. And uh, I was one, uh, along with his son, my uncle, we headed to his place. He had a small apartment, um, again, in the interior of uh, BC here. And uh, we actually, I had the task of sifting through his stuff and organizing it and you know, all the, everything you do uh, after a relative dies. And on a stack of books, amongst many, he had like hundreds and hundreds of books, like all up and down the sides of his uh, apartment, like wall to wall, like no, no space, you know, on, it wasn't hoarding. It was very meticulously organized, but very clearly he, he was on this sort of mission to understand, you know, life. And, uh, and on the stack, actually, when I was in the back room, I was a copy of Iron John just sitting there. You know, I'd heard of the book before and had never, you know, I'd even thought, you know, it'd be important to read, but there it was, uh, you know, right around that time looking like it had never been opened and uh, it was sort of freshly waiting. And I felt for me is what it felt like. And so that began, I you know, picked it up of course and thought, okay, now it's time. So I read Iron John and that really kicked off again, this whole map of uh, myself, which, you know, on the one hand felt almost like, uh relieving you know to feel a sense of like wow this all of this now starts to make sense like this journey that i've been on and the challenges that i've had uh and the other hand it was like well wait a second i'm not a unique snowflake you know like there's that there's something um sort of a pattern that shows up again and again for men at least in uh this culture that again that was a, a kind of a two-part recognition and that really kicked off my my gateway into men's work which is then now journeyed into, you know, I connected with the Mankind Project. I've done the New Warrior Training, uh, Sacred Sons, which was um, sort of an, yeah, an offshoot more recently. I attended there, wrote a piece, uh, been in and also co-led men's circles, uh, spoken at different uh, festivals now around the world about masculinity. And then, of course, more recently, the podcast, uh, The Mythic Masculine, which uh, I believe that's how you found my work uh, through that podcast or, yeah. And, um, primarily, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So maybe that's a long way of saying that yeah, I've been on this inquiry for a while and, and the most recent incarnation of it is the podcast of which I've been finding, uh, immensely satisfying. And I feel the, the listeners seem to as well. Look, absolutely. And, and that's a fascinating story. And it, it, there's a couple of questions which come up in my mind. And, and the, the, the first one is around Iron John, because I'm personally, I've got my own Iron John kind of, um, epiphany as well. Um, it came into my life in a, in a not too dissimilar way from the way that you're describing actually. Um, and I guess as an offshoot from, from that thought, um, do you think that kind of mythological speaking and I mean, I, I, to me, it sort of talks to a, a particular kind of man. I mean, it's not the language of, of every man and maybe, maybe it's a time in their life or, 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 or a soul age or something like that. But, um, mm. 
I guess for some men they pick that up and it, it doesn't make sense and perhaps they read it a decade later and it does. It's kind of one mm. of those books. Mm. Yeah, it's actually interesting you say that because um, uh, recently, I guess a few months ago now, last fall, I co-led a men's group here uh, in my community and um, we used actually the book as, a, as the backbone of the, of the three-month journey that we went on. So each week we read a chapter and then actually embodied the ritualistic uh, sort of elements of that chapter that week in the circle. And it was, it was profound um, to live the ritual or to live the myth in that way. And I think it became alive for a lot of men that um, they, they're right. Some reported, they're like, well, I, re- I picked it up, you know, a while ago and I just couldn't get into it. But now um, having it come alive and to live uh, inside the myth, suddenly it becomes much more real. And so I do feel for some men uh, that they need a kind of, I don't know, mythological, invitation to begin to see the relevancy in a way you know or the, to see mythically which is not a skill that is taught in this culture at all in fact um i would say it's it's a sort of a very literal you know culture and there's um i think it was bly who talks about you know there's such a there's a whole range of both experience and meaning making that comes from uh r- you know resurrecting the mythic imagination that is utterly lost on this culture because um, otherwise it just collapses into sort of fact or, or literate literateness. And, and again, it's, um, I think a lot of men ultimately are actually unsatisfied with that, but they don't actually know there's a, uh, other ways of seeing. I think that's true. And, and, and one of the areas I wanted to discuss with you was, which was this idea of, you know, how do we reach men these days? Because I think that we get broadly speaking, there's a different categories of men that perhaps would come to something like our group, the warrior within mm-hmm. there's men who, they kind of had the longer term view of seeing this work as almost like a lifelong journey. And I think for them, the mythic um, is, is, mu- is a much easier thing to grasp because they're taking that long term view where there are some men that they've had a traumatic experience in their life mm-hmm. and they just need something sorted out quickly. Um, and, and for them, perhaps it, it's not quite the right path um, and in that moment. Um, yeah. And so for me, I look at all this men's work, which is out there and things like Sacred Sons and all this other stuff. And I wonder whether um, um, it's right for everybody um, and, and how we sort of put our arms around all men in terms of where they are in, in the, you know, quote unquote journey. Um, right now, for example, you know, in the midst of, of the coronavirus, there's, there's men that, that, that need immediate help. Um, and obviously, you know, there's helplines and things like that, which can take care of short term trauma, but, you know, maybe getting them involved in the mythical at that point in their life is, is inappropriate. Mm. Huh. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I mean, I'd say that I see all of this work within a, a wider context, uh, which I would say is the crater of the loss of village. You know, that's what I'd say. And so in some, I, I don't, I don't know. Well, some, some men's groups and, and group and or men's orgs do teach that understanding. I think, I mean, mankind project, of course, I think has been one of the largest, uh, broadest organizations that, that I feel maybe skirts this understanding, um, uh, because it is about coming re, you know, rebuilding a culture of men that is, um, you know, authentic and, and integral and the rest. And also uh, sometimes it can circle to bit to sort of self, centric you know and self-focused mm. and i think that's one of the things uh, i recently interviewed michael mead on the podcast and uh, he shared about that in the early days of the movement that for him uh that those old days of the mythopoetic was really i mean for him he was saying his, himself and bly and maybe hillman was really struggling with how they relate to their own sons um, because there was a kind of understanding of a lack that had happened which again maybe bly does touch on this i think in iron john that you know, the industrial revolution had really decimated the relationship between father and son, where there was a relationship that was built because you worked and you um, just sort of uh, through osmosis, often by sharing space or working on the farm or whatever it was, you had a relationship, right, with your father. And then in the industrial revolution, and a lot of the men moved away from home or worked in the factories or whatever it is, in the office, even like my father did. And suddenly, where they went to became this suspicious, you know, other world. And uh, there's a great line that Bly talks about it. He says that the sons received uh, the temperament, but not the content or something like that. Yeah. The, the, temperance, the, the temperance, not the teaching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's this great loss. Right. And, 
so I feel like for a lot of men, you know, there's a, there's a broader father hunger that, that just runs so deep. And, um, you know, maybe even touching on, uh, I'm not sure how popular people like say Jordan Peterson is down in, yeah, in the, in Australia, but, um, those who don't know, he's a Canadian professor, you know, he's risen to some prominence and often he's popular with younger men. Um, and I, I also think because he constellates the archetypal father actually, which a lot of men are so hungry for because whether or not their father was present, there is like a father energy, which is a sort of a mature masculineness that again is part of the missingness. And that's a consequence as well of, again, not having these sort of natural ways of gathering as men. Uh, and so in many ways, men's orgs and groups that are trying to, I don't know, provide something that's healing and, and can, can create a vessel for soul work. I know it's important. And for me, it's always about also holding up the sense of, well, the consequence though is here because of, we don't have village anymore. Mm. You know, uh, so yeah, or you want to speak to that? Well, I was just going to say, I think that's, that's beautifully put. I think that's terrific. I think, um, I think some of the language um, may get lost on some men though. Um, and I think they're looking uh -huh. for something, you know, and sort of yeah. maybe there's a way of contemporizing that somehow. Like I look at, for example, um, the mission statement of something like Sacred Sons. And I know that there's probably a lot of men that are actually craving that, but, uh -huh. in, but in the words that they read, it's probably, you know, and I hate to use the word spiritual because it can be so misinterpreted, but there's something yeah. there around, you know, talking about alchemy and, and this stuff, which may actually end up, making them yeah. think that it's actually not, not for them when it truly yeah. is. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the problem with, um, again, a kind of, uh, I don't want to call it like a, a tri well, a tribal language, right. Really, which for those that fit that or don't fit that they'll feel, you know, invited or not. And certainly it's difficult to craft anything that's universal because, you know, I think that's part of the sort of, um, it sounds like a good idea, you know, to kind of let's create a universal men's movement or something. Right. But it, what that means is it becomes homogenous and uh, it, you know, it inevitably becomes like a franchise where it has to create the sameness in order to expand. Whereas of course, like a, a deep indigenous relationship to place means that it's specific. So whatever language or whatever ways that that particular group, you know, or peoples create or, or uh, an act, right. Is, is faithful to that place. So again, it's not not so much about um, universalizing, uh, but yet we have we live in a modern culture where again a lot of people have the same experience as sort of modern, disconnected, fragmented men. That yeah, there's there's a lot of longing for connection, um, and maybe a lot of men who don't even know that that's what they're longing for. You know, 100. like that's that yeah, and that's what happened to me as well. Like I didn't know until I sat for the first time actually uh, in Portugal it was at this uh, village village called Tamera where I sat in an intergenerational men's circle as part of their love school. And for the first time, it was actually really, I, I fully can track the experience, which was on the one hand, I recognized, first it was uncomfortable, right? Like, oh, uh, actually, this is a really funny story. Um, first time I began speaking about men's work was Australia. It was actually my second time there when I was on tour with my film. And uh, I think it was at maybe Earth Frequency, uh, one of the festivals out there. And I remember talking to the men, uh, it, was, it was a mixed group, men and women. And I said, uh, I asked, uh, how many women here currently meet in women's circle with some regularity? And I think it was maybe 80% of the women put up their hands. And then I said, how many men meet with some regularity in men's circle? Zero. Uh, and not only that, this uh, fellow in the front row, um, he felt, I think he might've been his maybe late 50s. <laughs> he goes, what would we talk about? <laughs> 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 and it was uh it was such a genuine curiosity mixed with the kind of like you could hear the indictment a little bit like men men don't talk about anything interesting um which is so much the the current culture for those who haven't entered into those spaces right it's this fear of a kind of maybe confrontive energy mixed with uh maybe an unconscious fear of vulnerability right and yet when i was first in my space with um, an inter particularly intergenerational, that was really profound to me. What I recognized was uh, that one, a whole piece of me, which I didn't even realize was always on when there was women present, relaxed. Yeah, a whole, a whole like program running, which is always jostling for some kind of position with women. You know, it didn't matter if it was erotic or not or whatever. It was just the presence of a woman, cre like the program was activated. And then when I was with men, it wasn't. And suddenly I'm, I've experienced its deep sense of rest that was just profound, that I could just 
<sighs> just rest, right? And there was, I could, one way I might say it is because the men there were holding the masculine, I could relax the masculine for my, myself. I could put down the, I always got to be holding the masculine pillar. I could put that down for a second and rest in the wider field of masculinity. And that was such a profound place of, of just soul rest, you know, that I, I felt such gratitude. And then a kind of kinship developed with the other men. I was like, oh, wow, you're not weird and scary and others, you know, you're so different than me. It's like we have so many of the same experiences. And suddenly, um, I, I, like a switch happened. And I actually resisted going back into a mixed space with women. Like I was suddenly like, oh, this is so great. I don't want to go back in a, a space with women and get it back into that program, you know, all that stuff. And of course we did and continued. But yeah, it was a profound recognition for me. And I think so many men want that, but until they experience it, they actually don't know what they're missing. Beautifully summed up. I mean, I resonate so deeply with, with mm -hmm. so much of what you just said. And, and, and I hear that in feedback all the time from the guys that come and sit in a circle and, and worry within. It's like, I actually didn't understand how much I craved just bringing around my brothers. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm interested in that chap that, that said, you know, what would we talk about? Because, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I first experienced um, being with just men when I, in my time in Africa um, with, with the, with the um, Samburu. Um, in northern Kenya and uh, the first men's circle that I sat in with them there was obviously a massive language barrier anyway but you know hours went by without anybody saying anything um, and you, you're with a group of different ages of men you know from from late teenagers all the way up to to, to you know very old guys and um, it was absolutely profound without a word being spoken and so so what would we talk about well perhaps you don't yeah. even need to <laughs> good point yeah 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 there's something about the transmission, I feel. Yeah, like the frequency of, I don't know what to call it, the masculine that, mm. that yeah, transmits. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And that maybe it doesn't need words. Yeah, it just needs presence mm. in a shared field. And like, that's enough. Yeah, I remember there was this, this, this elder and a, a flock of birds came over and he, he, he looked up at them and he was kind of just looking at them for a long time. And then when, when they passed, he just, he caught my eye and there was just this a bit of eye gazing that was going on. And he transmitted everything I needed to know about <laughs> The experience that he just had watching those birds fly over without without a single word and i, I was just hit by it you know right in the center of my chest wow um, beautiful yeah it is it, it's amazing um so yeah i think that's what you just you've just summed up um very neatly um this 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 uh, feeling that a lot of guys get and we hear a lot around this this mm. craving that they didn't even realize that they had um just to be in a space of men and no women and the idea of this um program that you run i think every man listening to this will feel that <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i'd love actually to add a bit too on uh just and again this applies certainly to heterosexual relationships but likely also those that have male partners and lovers but there's something in the mixed relating field that especially in relationships like like say partnerships though where the the way that our social society is structured when we don't have these other spaces to polarize, to consciously polarize, like the women be with the women, the men be with men, and maybe those of two spirit and non-binary. Again, that's an emerging conversation for a space for them and the medicine they carry. But there's something about the polarization, which um, almost like disentangles all of the expectation of what one is supposed to be giving to the other. You know, and it's, there's something to be said that um, like a lot of men often bear the weight of uh, trying to be everything, of course, that the, their say female partner wants them to be um, unconsciously though, like as in, because the women often don't have the space for women to, to be in that field, they can often look to the woman or sorry, look to the man to fulfill all those needs that actually are better served coming from women. Right. And, and the guys can feel like, oh, like I'm failing or why does she want to talk to me all the time or, you know, whatever it is. And, and I, I deal with that a lot in previous relationships, too, where I was like, I don't know. I don't have it. Like, I don't have the thing that I think you want, but you keep asking me for it. And the same thing with men. Like often they look to women often for their only uh, uh, avenues of vulnerability, of intimacy in terms of just, you know, um, embodiment often, right? Like they'll, they'll only say, seek that from a female partner, not realizing though that again, women have their own medicine, but there's a whole other type of medicine that men carry that uh, can only come from the realm of men. 
And so for me, it's actually a structural issue that can be served by, again, polarizing and like juicing up those batteries. And then when you come back together, it's like there's clarity of the contact after that. And now all of a sudden, like I feel often so much more like juiced when I come in contact with my female partner after being in men's group. And there's like a clarity of the charge. And it often is highly, it can be highly erotic actually when we come back together and it's like, boom. So anyway, I want to speak to that as well, that there is a kind of medicine that both carry that is actually really nourishing when there's a disentanglement and then a return. Yeah, I, I love that too. I, I think for some women though, there's probably some suspicion around what men might do in a men's group that it may mm. not actually be serving the relationship. It may be some sort of negative, which um, it clearly isn't, or certainly you know, in, in the case of most of the, the work that I've seen. Um, mm. But there's still a, perhaps a deep suspicion in this modern contemporary time that we live in now about what men might get up to when they get together. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can speak archetypally for a second if uh, mm. I'm always seeing with this lens, but often what happens is, um, particularly in relationships where, again, the, the unconscious mythic layer isn't, isn't known, is oftentimes there's uh, uh, two kinds of constellations that happen. Uh, one is the father-daughter dynamic, and the other is the mother-son. Uh, and by that meaning that a lot of women will often become unconscious mothers to the men, right? Who seek a kind of unconscious mothering from the woman uh, and vice versa, where the, the women will seek this fathering for unconsciously from the men. And what happens though, is it keeps a kind of adolescent um, uh, unconscious layer going, which for women often who are constellating the mother though, they do have a fear that the man would actually seek intimacy elsewhere. Mm. Like as in that can happen where the woman actually feels a sense of, um, I don't know, a kind of unconscious control of the man, right? Because if, if they're looking to her for a lot of, again, intimacy and, and that kind of place of rest and all that. So there is a fear sometimes of, uh-oh, will I lose him actually if, if I'm not the center of the universe, you know what I mean, as the unconscious mother. And oftentimes that can happen with uh, the men as well for women to go to women's groups and the guys feel, oh, wait, well, I'm not the center of the universe anymore. Because uh, it takes an inner maturity actually to recognize like, oh, I'm glad they're not looking to me for that unconscious medicine, you know, and I trust that if they go to those places in the polarized uh, settings, that they can come back more full and more mature and we can truly meet as peers and no longer as these unconscious, uh, you know, parental archetypes. Yeah, I think that's important, important to state. I really do. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it leads me on to this discussion a little bit of masculine feminine in, in, in general. Um, and, and what I've noticed, and I also noticed it in your conversation with, with Michael Mead um, when mm -hmm. I listened to that just on the weekend, actually. But um, uh -huh. uh, it, it feels to me like a lot of um, men of prominence in this men's work actually began studying the feminine before they moved to the masculine. I mean, he said it, he said it if you uh -huh. think. Um, I believe it's true of Michael Mead. It's certainly true of Robert Bly. Um, do you think there's a need to actually, that that's the trajectory to understand the feminine first? Mm. You know, it's interesting. I see that as the consequence though of what I was saying earlier, that, that the, the kind of mature father, the mature culture of men is largely absent, uh, at least in, again, in modern, most modern cultures. So, so in some sense, it makes, it makes sense that the feminine would be explored first, right? Because um, as I said, there's also this rise of the feminine um, coming back into a proper relationship, you know, to the, I would say the unconscious masculine or the, you know, the tyrant uh, patriarchy. And so again, so it makes sense that that would be present, especially for men often that are willing to make that journey. You know, like for me, we talk about this in episode uh, six, I believe, with uh, Eamon Armstrong, the boy hero must die. Where what it talks about is, um, you know, a lot of men who grow up as boys, you know, the adolescent um, or the boy archetype of the hero is a very natural kind of noble uh, way of actually, you know, wanting to help, you know, and wanting to save. And we see that actually, of course, in a lot of superhero movies, you know, today, which is, again, this, this elevation of the hero. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, ha yeah, but what happens is the hero is actually in rising to save the mother, and I think Bly might have talked about this too, but really try to save the mother from the pain of, you know, the world really. And the, the tragedy of that is that the boy cannot do that. Like he just, he, 
you know, you can't save the mother, obviously. There's just much bigger forces out there and her, she's got her own journey. But the boy who truly wants to alleviate her pain, you know, feels that. Um, and then there's something about being defeated and recognizing that the defeat is not personal, that it's actually, you know, it's an impossible uh, quest, that that is the gateway into actually relationships with other men. As, as I called it like the, the league of failed heroes, mm. you know, is really where, where brotherhood begins. And so um, I see that again as the natural outgrowing, of course, as men who, who begin with the feminine is the center of the universe, right? Like that is natural because as a child, um, you know, I see it with my son now who's 18 months, like I say, you know, mom's everything still, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm a, I, I'm appreciated, I think, but by and large, you know, when he's upset or when he wakes up from a nap or whatever it is, it's like, yo, where's mom? I, mom, I need mom now. So again, it's natural that the orientation of a boy is to the feminine. And then like Bly talks about too, in initiatory cultures, there's a time when the older men will come for the boy and consciously sever that relationship to the mother as like the central figure. And what they do is then they kind of re um, orient the boy to one, a mature relationship with the men. And for me, that's like the start of that understanding of, oh, wow, there's a whole other cosmology of, of masculinity and, and the realms of men, which now the boy is entered into. Uh, and because in this culture, largely we don't practice that anymore, that severance never happens, right? Like boys grow up to be men. And again, like I said, unconsciously project a mother onto their partners. And I would say patriarchy as a whole is one big unconscious mother wound. That's one way to think about it. Again, it's this idea of, of trying to dominate the feminine, right? Out of a, a kind of a, a inferiority complex of, because the feminine is that so much vaster and so much more powerful as we're finding even with COVID right now, of course, you know, that uh, any idea that we had that we were in control of nature is very easily, you know, and sort of, again, tragically uh, proven otherwise. And so we're contending now, I mean, individually and as a species, of course, with, whoa, how do we kind of come back to the right orientation uh, to life as well? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. So I guess, you know, what, what I'm hearing you say is it's not just the, um, the, the relationship. Well, I guess the relationship changes with mum and, and you know, you, you're severing those ties to a certain degree, but the relationship changes to be a relationship with the great mother or nature or yeah, exactly. understanding that, that, that wildness, that wilderness within you, um, yeah. as well as yeah. beginning to have the relationship with men. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a two-part a two two part process, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then, yeah, and just to say too, last thing, on the other side of that, though, is the reapproach, I believe, to the mother from a mature place, mm -hmm. uh, where, again, it's not about everything she was or, or should be or shouldn't be, but you actually are able to see her as a woman, as a, as a woman who, you know, is a woman, um, uh, she was your mother, is your mother, and also a woman who, you know, was a being before she was your mother. You know, like that, that's a really kind of mature, <clears throat> um, beautiful way of actually reapproaching and saying, you know, again, as the child, you're also not the center of the universe, you know, to, that, to the mother, that she is a very uh, unique being unto herself as well. Absolutely. And I guess it, it probably leads me on. Uh, Michael, and I've heard others too, were talking about this idea of masculine and, and feminine almost being too reductionist for them. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, is it, do you share that feeling? You know, it's always challenging because I would say, I certainly there's a certain, I don't know what to call it, like a um, politically correct uh, way that, that these these terms are being challenged, you know, often because they do come across as gendered and then, then become prescriptive. Um, and now all of a sudden, you know, men are supposed to be this way and women are supposed to be this way. And there's a certain, I think, um, thread of radical feminism, which does believe that all gender is oppressive. And ultimately it feels like that, you know, it should be whatever you feel like. And that's the ultimate triumph. And then I look to indigenous cultures that seem to, again, have a very different understanding about what gender is. Um, not to say that there isn't challenges, you know, within the cultures of um, domestic abuse and all that, for sure, like those, those exist. But in especially in ceremony, there seems to be a relationship to the genders, which isn't one that is a, gender is not a problem to solve, right? Like that's one way I think I've come to understand it, that, that it's a question of roles, like, what is the role of the men like in the ceremony? What is the role of the women? What is the role of two-spirit, let's say? Um, 
and everybody finds their place in this constellation to serve the ceremony. Whereas, you know, in a, in a modern uh, uh, or sort of modernized or civilized understanding um, that it, it, it's seen as a problem to solve, right? And so that's why you get this battle, you know, between them. And for me, it's really about coming to right relationship. And so from that context, Pat McCabe, an indigenous grandmother in episode seven, I believe. Yeah, she talks about this. You know, she says that there is such a thing or you, you know, what if there was such a thing as um, sort of the medicine of the deep medicine of the masculine, the mature masculine that is vital and necessary from, from a thriving life paradigm is what she calls it, right? And um, very different than what we call the modern culture often, which is a sort of domi- dominant or domineering paradigm. Um, and so I get, this is all I'm saying, I, you know, whenever I approach these questions, is it, is it useful or is it not useful? I, as, I also find it really depends on the context of the moment, the cultural context. And like if somebody was wanting to replace them and say, well, let's use yin and yang, you know, instead that feels more degendered, you know, this idea of these two energies. And I say, okay. <laughs> and there's just something that feels is getting lost, you know, in this mythic, um, relationship or mythic experience that I found that, you know, there's something about being in a men's space that I find deeply nourishing and different than being in a women's space. And, you know, whatever language is needed to, to be able to say that that's true from my own subjective experience feels important to me. And if somebody just says, well, no, it's all just energies. Again, I feel like it strips something uh, that is vital to the experience. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I, I think I agree with that. I think I agree. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, there's another question I had too around, around um, part of the discussion that you had with Michael and that was in the role mm-hmm. of the four, the four sort of primary archetypes, because we tend to use them a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was really fascinated by what he had to say around this idea that the soul is like constantly um, mm-hmm. you know, creating infinite archetypes. And that it's again, maybe, maybe reductionist to talk about just uh-huh. the primary archetypes and um, yeah. I think I agree with that. Um, I still think it's a great starter kit, but, yeah. um, but, yeah, yeah. but now I'm kind of looking at it through different eyes after listening to what he had to say about that. Mm. Yeah, me too. I was, uh, I was appreciating how he was sort of blunt, I think, with it. And I, I mean, I see in him too this kind of uh, alerting people to the danger of, of codifying, right? Like, I think that's what he spoke to. Because suddenly, if, it's almost like if the map becomes the territory, then there's something lost. There's something now where we've sort of in the level of abstract, you know, um, uh, the way it is instead of constantly revisiting and saying, yeah, what does it mean to be a warrior now? Right. Is it, was it the same as it was in the eighties? What does it mean to be a lover now? So I think if there's a way to continually return and like uh, excavate again and circle again, you know, these archetypes, I think they still can be valuable, but as soon as it's, you know, this box, this box, this box, this box, you know, then I feel like, again, it becomes reductionist and, and a bit dangerous too, because it tends, it, it can supplant the subjective um, inquiry that many men carry, right? And, and also an authentic sense of, yeah, like that, you know, I would say the warrior maybe back then in the 80s, say, yeah, could have been really the warrior of the self, like, like really coming to um, excavating, you know, one's own, I don't know, conditioning or trauma, whatever that is, you know, and maybe that was enough for that era. And now I would say that the clear call to the warrior is to be a warrior in service to life. Um, another another um, sort of language that I've heard around this is to defend the sacred, right? And of course, Standing Rock was a huge piece of that. And so for me, like, so for a warrior to only circle this idea of the self or to be good at business or, you know, whatever it is like that kind of energy that to me feels actually out of contact with the current moment. Whereas to be a warrior now is to really see that, Oh, life is asking for us to be warriors on her behalf. I know. And and that can look like different things. So again, what does lover mean now in this context? You know, does it mean, I don't know, the conquest of women, you know, or does it mean the deep intimate relation with uh, the world? you know, coming back into sensual contact with the world, which is what Martin Shaw and I talked about recently last week, which is on a forthcoming episode, what Charles Eisenstein says, you know, the shift from uh, mother earth to lover earth. What does it come, what does it mean to come back into that kind of, you know, a whole new relationship to what, what earth wants and how do we become like lovers to that? I mean, that's really profound, interesting territory. So that's what I see, you know, like they are starting 
starting the conversation for a lot of men to have that map, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. And I think it's really important that we say, what do they mean now? Like, let's explore together. Yeah, I think that's, that's profound because I think typically men, we, we like to get instruction manuals and we like to see For things sure. in a nice <laughs> order. So if you can say, this is, what, this is what they are and we're too prescriptive about it, they'll tend to um, miss out on a lot, I'd imagine. So I yeah. think this conversation is important. And, and I, I, bringing up the conversation you have with Charles Eisenstein is interesting because that's the part of that particular podcast that I hooked onto when he was talking about um, you know, being in service to life. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was terrific and, and a lovely way of contemporizing these archetypes and thinking about it through, through, through more modern or more contemporary uh, lens. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So I guess it, it's leading to a big question. It's a question I had written down there at the beginning in, and that is, you know, how would you describe or like being a man in, in 2020? What does it even mean? Cause there's so many conflicting ideas out there. And, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of men are kind of lost in terms of, I'm not even sure what it means to actually be a man these days. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's your take on all that? Yeah. Yeah. Big question. Yeah. Very. I mean, yeah, I'd say the, I mean, it's a good question to, to keep wondering. And for me, the podcast is again, one level of me kind of wondering out loud with other men that I admire and, you know, appreciate their perspectives. Um, because I do feel um, if any time that there's a, a kind of attempt to craft a universal, you know, prescription, that's the trouble we get into. Right. And, and I think, a lot of the kind of challenges to toxic masculinity uh, or, or ma traditional masculinity or whatever that means is based on that understanding that there's a universal that was upheld to say a man means this. And if you're not this, you're a deviant or you're you know, not manly or whatever it is. So yeah, I'd say a lot of the uh, uh, kind of pillars of understanding now are dissolving for at least from a, a context that seemed to hold for a bit of a time. But the irony of course is that that even was not very long. Like this whole idea of traditional masculinity was a very narrow window, probably from maybe the fifties, you know, even into the late sixties, seventies, it felt like it was changing already, you know, like a more sensitive emotional man was already coming in. And then into the eighties, it was, I mean, maybe characterized in America largely as the, you know, corporate, um, uh, like, I don't know, chasing the dollar or the wolf of wall street or whatever, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then the 90, you know, so it's, it's constantly changing in some ways. And so anytime there's also pointing to this is the masculinity we're up against, there may be experience for a lot of men saying, well, I wasn't, that wasn't what I was taught either, you know? So again, it's like, how do you find footing in this? And that's why I'd say, I think as a whole, a lot of men right now, I think part of the challenge is being willing to be humbled. Feels like a big piece of it, you know, because in some ways, that's also contending with privilege, which I feel is a problematic word in a way, because again, it, it doesn't really encompass a kind of, I don't know, like a complex experience that a lot of men actually have. Um, but as a, as a catch-all, just for a moment, this idea that, you know, if you're operating within a certain paradigm that tends to uh, benefit you without you actually knowing that you're benefiting, right? That, and then the experience of others who aren't that you know, uh, gender or skin color or whatever it is, then it's a rude awakening, you know, to really begin to understand, oh, wow, like, yeah, I've been the recipient of a lot of things that I didn't necessarily earn. Uh, and so there's a humbling that has to happen and a kind of a deep willingness to actually to learn, you know, and I, and I find that, you know, when I'm in spaces where a lot of these conversations are happening in mixed spaces often, or people of color and the rest, I tend to not say very much, you know, because I'm really just wanting to learn and listen and, and, and just again, decenter, you know, myself, a lot of men have their challenge with that, you know, if they've been the center of it in general. Uh, so to kind of step back, but don't disengage, like don't, but don't leave, like to stay, but just get out of the way, you know, and, and pay attention and listen. That's a big piece of it, I think. And to wonder about all of this with other men is actually vital because for me too, again, I don't, I have a problem taking up more room in these other mixed spaces. But I, ha I have a much easier time when I'm with other men and we can wonder about this together. You know, I do feel that's the appropriate place to wonder about these things. Because I don't think there is a script, but certainly there is a kinship that can be developed through the willingness to meet and to talk about and to learn and to read and to experience, you know, uh, that I feel is 
signaling a kind of, I don't know, I, I would call it like a, a cultural or generational willingness to actually kind of, I don't know, depersonalize in a way, you know, and, and to actually begin to reach out. And there's experience I had with um, Sacred Sons, actually, which, you know, I talk about in the essay. But we did some, I would call it really actually somatic healing work, really, you know, which um, is um, I've had some experience with as well. But uh, what I, what I, I used this image that came to me in that time, which was, you know, a lot of the men, there was facilitation there in the, in the circle with these men, but also the rest of the men in our little pod were also participants in actually creating like a healing uh, experience for all of the men that were present. And I had this image actually, and it felt almost like, yeah, like mythically that we, we had become one organism that, you know, that, that the, the personal identity of each man actually dissolved into this larger cell of masculinity for that moment. And through the shared willingness for the men to support and serve each other and the man in the, currently in the seat in the middle, that healing was able to take place or at least push forward that healing and all of the men could participate in that. Uh, bef- and, and it was a healing that could only have happened with that many men willing to give presence and attention and the rest. And so I really felt this sense of almost like the fabric of masculinity was actually uh, shifting into a kind of reflective and um, sort of solidarity uh, field of mutual support and healing, which is actually what I think is really vital. And again, it's all about being willing to yeah, to step outside of our own, you know, a paradigm of, of I'll do it alone. I'm the lone wolf. Like I don't need other men. And that, that uh, I think kind of creates the cultural possibility actually of a much wider shift um, going on that again, we need each other for, we can't heal alone. And again, I, I really love that. And again, Michael Mead was talking about a little bit when he talked about when the fissure appears in a man's psyche or whatever is part of the process, that's the time to kind of put him in the center um, yeah, where exactly. everybody can do the work and, and uh, sort of on, on his behalf. And the idea of, I never really thought of it about being kind of one organism, but it's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah. 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 And it was profound. I had, it was very clear to me, like that's what was happening, mm. you know, that we were all, we were all became this, this intelligence that was greater than any one man. That's amazing. Did you share that with others? And did anybody come across that at the same, same time? Was there? Well, I wrote it in the essay. So uh, yeah, if you check it out. Yeah. And I, I mean, I had a few men mentioned to me too, that they, they didn't have words for it, but that, that helped them actually articulate right. what was true for them too. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. And um, I, yeah, I realize time is getting on, but there's one thing that I wanted to, to, to talk to you about, and that is obviously, sure your connection to, to our country, Australia. And um, mm-hmm. we are talking a little bit um, before we started recording um, that I guess part of your initiation, part of your rite of passage occurred um, during your journeys down under. So um, could mm-hmm. you speak to that for us? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, in 2000, uh, I had a high school sweetheart. I'd graduated high school at that point, And for different reasons, we ended up separating. And I kind of fell into the deepest heartbreak you know, of my life at that point. And um, I really wanted to get away as far away as I possibly could from Canada. And that just happened to be Australia. And so I saved up, you know, what I could throughout that summer. And then the fall, this was September uh, 2001, actually, uh, that I headed to Australia for as, you know, I tried, I thought a year, I was like, I give myself a year. And that experience really taught me a lot about one, wherever you go, there you are, you know, um, that I thought I could, you know, outrun my heartbreak and all the rest. And then suddenly, you no, know, came with me. Um, and it was the, really was the, the initiatory ground that I was furthest away from, you know, my family and friends and everybody who I'd ever known. Um, and I really, it was a test in a way that I think many youth do this. They, they craft unconscious initiations because the culture doesn't do it for them. And sometimes it can be drugs and alcohol and all the rest, often travel or extreme sports, you know, it can be that. So for me, it was that I, I came down and ended up working in Sydney for four months, um, just sort of, you know, making odd jobs when I could. Uh, and then after New Year's that year, I hit the road and began traveling all over the country. And um, ultimately ended up in uh, Innisfail, working on a banana farm uh, with some really interesting characters um, that uh, I actually ended up writing a short story about my time there. Sort of uh, ended up being a kind of Stephen Kingish style, kind of a macabre story, but, um, Ended up uh, uh, not lasting very long, actually. I mean, any banana pickers out there, whoa, that is hard work. 
uh, carrying those big bundles, you know, 10 hours a day, whatever it was. Um, and so ultimately I ended up sort of being defeated uh, in that my money ran out uh, about eight months and uh, ended up, you know, getting enough to get a flight back and, and got home. But I really felt a sense one of that initiatory experience, you know, of really just going out there as far as I could. And only after I got back, I had such a profound sort of n not anything changing. Like that was my experience. You know, I got back, I was like, wow, I must be so different. Everybody else must be so different. Can't believe how life must have changed. You know, and I got back and everybody's like, hey, how was it? You know, pretty good, cool. <laughs> and, and, it, and it was such a letdown, right? Because again, I see that I now know in the initiatory journey, the return, being welcomed back by the community, being recognized that you're different is such a necessary ingredient in this. And nobody did it. Nobody knew how to do it. Nobody thought about doing it, right? Um, and so again, I saw, it was such a profound, I don't know, sadness that came after and I didn't know why. And I think, again, many people who do this go away or men who do this to come back and maybe have a similar experience. So in some ways it taught me again, that, that led me to lots of other experiences, you know, where I ended up meeting mentors and elders much later and began to sort of approach this cultural understanding of like, oh, they had, this is why I did this, or this is why it felt this way. You know, so in some ways I needed to go through that to then recognize the absence of these things. But um, I definitely feel indebted to Australia as being that, that mythic, deeply, deeply elemental ground, you know, where I first, um, was able to kind of get away to the other world for me at least. And it was profound actually, because I'll just finish this by saying I ended up speaking at a festival yeah, back in 2016 when I came back and uh, there was a youth there who was uh, Australian um, who was at the festival and he'd seen me talk earlier in the day and we got to chatting and uh, he, he said to me, he's like, Oh um, yeah, you, you spoke earlier today. I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, you know, I just got back from Canada. Uh, I was away, you know, cause I wanted to get away as far as I, could from my home, which was Australia. And, uh, and he said, you know, and I got back and nothing's different, hmm. you know? And I said to him, well, look, here's what should have happened. And I was able to tell him actually, this is probably why you did what you did and didn't know it. And this is what should have happened when you got back. And the recognition that he felt, I think of being seen hmm. by just by another, you know, slightly older man to just say, Hey, you know, and to actually even, even apologize and say, Hey, I'm sorry, this should have happened for you. You should have been welcomed back, you know, by the elders in your community. You should have been seen as different because you achieved something, you know, important. And uh, there was something in that that felt healing. It like completed the loop, you know, for, I couldn't, I didn't have that either, but I could be something of that to him. And the last thing to say maybe is that Martin Shaw has this great phrase, phrase when he says, uh, if you haven't been fed, become bread. <laughs> I, maybe I, maybe I was a little bread then for that kid. I, I love that. I, I, I really love that. Um, mm. I can't think of a better place to end it in. So mm. um, with, with that little gem, so thank you. But um, I, I will just say, you know, uh, the men within uh, Warrior Within, we're, we're, we're big supporters of your work. Um, mm. and, and I promote it as much as I can because I think it's, it's highly insightful and, and, and exactly your lines with... Um, where we're at and, and what we're trying to achieve. So um, mm. I just want to thank you for what you do. Um, Beautiful. And thank, thank you, you for, for, um, for this chat. Appreciate it. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Asher. Yeah, really appreciate the invitation and to you know, wonder about this stuff and hopefully it serves your community. Thanks. <laughs>